Hello everyone. Welcome to today's lecture on biodiversity and the extinction crisis. We're going to use this to kind of frame some of the ideas that we study throughout the course and to give you an idea of what's going on at a global level with in terms of biodiversity. So we're going to start off with a definition of biodiversity. And biodiversity is a measure of the living organisms found in an area. It's often measured in what's called species richness, which is just the number of species found in a given area. But you can include other measures like genetic diversity, as well as something called end endemism. And we're going to talk about endemic species a little bit later in the lecture, so you'll learn more about endemism. The reason we're looking at this is that scientists estimate that we are entering an extinction crisis because the current rate of extinction of species is much higher than the historical rate of species loss. Scientists come to term this the sixth mass extinction and during class today you'll learn about other extinctions uh, during the in-class assignment. So let's briefly define extinction. Extinction is the global loss of a species. And if we think about it at a local scale, that's actually considered extirpation. So when a species disappears from a particular part of the earth, but is not globally lost, it is considered extirpated from that area. Before extinction, species are classified as endangered and there are different levels of this. So the IUCN, which we'll learn about in a second, uh, classifies things as vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, extinct in the wild, or extinct. So here's the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And beyond classifying species and their threat of extinction, they have a list of what they consider to be the major extinction threats at a global level. So habitat loss and degradation is uh, one of the key ones, as well as invasive non-native species. Overexploitation of natural resources, such as overfishing or overhunting. Pollution and disease. And human-induced climate change. And these play different roles in the loss of species at a global level. And uh, with it, particular species, they may be threatened by a single one of these or by multiple threats, uh, causing their populations to decline and head toward extinction. So as we get started and we think about species richness, let's think about species richness at a global scale. How many species are there on Earth? So one of the problems with this is we have a lot of unknown species. There are a lot of insects that have not been described and a lot of prokaryotes, that is bacteria and archaea, that have not been described. But scientists estimate that there are about 8 million to 10 million total species. And with that number, we want to think about where they're found and what they are. So if we think about where they're found, there's a phenomenon called the latitudinal diversity gradient. And that is that at high latitudes, like the poles, there's very low biodiversity. And at low latitudes, like the equator, there is very high biodiversity. So the highest biodiversity is found near the equator, the lowest near the poles, and you have a gradient in between where as you move from the pole toward the equator, you add more and more species uh, during, that, uh, during that movement. So the majority of the species richness is found in the tropics. And again, species richness is the count of how many species are found in an area. So now let's look at species richness on a global scale looking at one degree latitude by one degree longitude cells or squares spread out on the globe and how many species of birds are found in each of those. Okay, so one degree latitude by one degree longitude is about 70 miles by 70 miles or 110 
by 110 kilometers. And if we look at this, we see that areas along the Andes Mountains in the rainforests of the Amazon are where the highest species richness is found on the planet. All right, and this is for birds. And in some of these areas, you can find 959 species of birds in an area that's 70 miles by 70 miles. Another piece of biodiversity is endemic species or endemism. And these are species that are unique to a geographic area. And we actually have a species that's unique to northeastern Michigan, northeastern Lower Peninsula. And that's the Kirtland's warbler. And the Kirtland's warbler historically only bred in these areas of Michigan. Now it has expanded a little as its population has increased, but it is Michigan's kind of most unique bird, and many argue that it should be the state bird, and can now actually have a, a, a custom license plate with Kirtland's warblers on it. If we look at endemic birds, we can see Michigan actually shows up here because of the Kirtland's warbler. But again, that pattern of highest levels, highest levels of endemism is in that area as you start to go from the Amazon rainforest up into the Andes Mountains. These foothills areas of the Andes are where the highest biodiversity and the highest endemism is found. And what you see here is that there are cells in this area where there are as many as 89 species of birds that are only found within that cell. That means the entire global range of that species is less than 70 miles by 70 miles. And therefore, if that particular cell was deforested, we might lose most of those species. Whereas as you look in areas of northern, uh, northern latitudes, for example, there are very few endemic species and then less of an impact if a, a particular area is lost. That's one of the reasons that we're so concerned about tropical deforestation. If we look at these species and what, um, what makes up the most of uh, the different species, the biggest uh, contributor to biodiversity is insects. Okay, so we know eight to 10 million species and more than half of those are insects. We belong to the group called chordates, and you can see that chordates make up a thin sliver of the Earth's biodiversity in terms of number of species, especially relative to insects. So there are very few species of chordates, yet they are what fascinate many of us the most. Um, and uh, we can look then at how many of these species there are globally and then look, say, in particular areas. So if we think about um, this diversity of insects, we know that biodiversity is highest in the tropics and biodiversity of insects is even more impressively high in the tropics uh, relative to other groups of organisms. And we'll see that in the, in the upcoming slides. So if we look globally, there are 391,000 species of vascular plants. Those are plants that have a circulatory system that allows them to move water through uh, a circulatory system. We have 5.5 million species of insects estimated. Of amphibians, there are about 8,000 species, birds, 10,000 species, and mammals, to which we belong, 6,400 species. Now, if we look at a country like Panama, so Panama, you know, is uh, in the tropics. It's closer to the equator than we are. It's about half the size of the state of Michigan. And if we look at Panama, there are around 10,000 vascular plant species in Panama. 50,000 to 100,000 insect species and possibly more, or greater than 200 amphibian species, more than 1,000 bird species, and more than 230 mammal species. Now let's compare that to Michigan. In Michigan, we have about one-sixth 
as many plant species, even though we have twice as much land area. We have uh, many fewer insect species, many fewer amphibian species, fewer bird species, and many fewer mammal species as well. So you can see this is evidence of the latitudinal diversity gradient, and it gives you an idea of how rich the diversity is in places like Panama. If we look at principles of biodiversity now to kind of sum this up, species richness is much greater in the tropics, in tropical ecosystems like rainforests and coral reefs. And this is part of the latitudinal diversity gradient. Insects make up the majority of Earth's biodiversity. An interesting side note to this though, is that this really only applies to terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems. There are very few insects that associate with saltwater ecosystems. A single hectare of rainforest in Panama. So this is an area of rainforest that's the size of two football fields side by side, about 100 meters by 100 meters, can have as many plant species as all of Michigan and more insect species than all of Michigan. So that gives you an idea of how extreme this latitudinal diversity gradient can be. So we go back now and we think about we have all this biodiversity, but we constantly hear about the loss of biodiversity driven by these threats that the IUCN has identified for um, the loss of biodiversity and what makes species endangered and prone to extinction. Visually, these strike quite a sad story. The loss of forests, death of fish due to pollution, overharvesting of rhinoceros, bird collisions with windows in cities, invasive species like the red lionfish in the Caribbean Ocean. All of these things go together and make up a very sad picture that leads scientists to worry about us entering a mass extinction. This photo shows the burning of the Amazon rainforest, something that did not historically happen. So historically, tropical rainforests did not burn other than areas that were cut down um, and set fire intentionally. Other areas were too wet to burn regularly. Now, with large scale deforestation and climate change, we see a lot more forest fires in the Amazon. Why is this concerning? Because there's so many species in the Amazon and so many of them are endemic. And we worry that losing areas of rainforest results in the loss of species. So what you're going to explore in class today is the history of mass extinctions. And We'll put this in kind of a context here. Life on Earth began about 3.5 billion years ago with the first prokaryotes, and these were bacteria and archaea. Those are what prokaryotes are. They're organisms that do not have a nucleus. And then eukaryotic life began with single-celled eukaryotes about 2 billion years ago. Eukaryotes are organisms that have a nucleus. And multicellular eukaryotes came around about a billion years later. And during the time that those multicellular eukaryotes have been on Earth, there have been five documented mass extinctions. And you'll explore those more in class and learn more about what caused each of those mass extinctions. So what's next? There's a short quiz on D2L based on this lecture material. And then you're going to watch some videos by other LBC faculty members that talk about the organism groups that they study and biodiversity loss that's occurring in those organism groups. So those will be your next steps, and you'll want to follow the instructions that come after each of those.